Welcome to the screencast on proteins. I'm going to go through this quite quickly as it's very much uh, for revision. You should be quite familiar with all of this material. So the first uh, thing to consider when looking at proteins is the structure of the monomer that proteins are member, made out of. So remember that proteins are known as polypeptides and the polypeptides, like any polymer, are made of monomers and the monomer for a protein is an amino acid. Okay, and you have to know the structure of an amino acid. So essentially what it is, it's a central carbon atom which is attached to four groups, one of which is simply a hydrogen atom, one is a carboxylic acid group, okay, this arrangement of carbon double bonded with oxygen and then carbon bonded to OH. Okay, so this is the same for any organic acid, whether it's a fatty acid or ethanoic acid, uh, or in this case, um, an amino acid. Okay, so this group is what we encounter whenever we come across an organic acid. Okay, at the other end of the molecule, we have the amino group, okay, which is nitrogen bonded to two hydrogens, and this is the bit that confers. Um, and the fact that it's uh, toxicity on amino acids, which is why we cannot store amino acids in the liver. We have to break them down, uh, which is something you'll come across when you do the upper six course. But anyway, we chop the amino group off, and we can actually convert that into urea, the yellow pigment in your urine. Okay, and we use the rest of this molecule, gets used in respiration. Anyway, so that's the amino group, and as we'll see later on, the amino groups um, react with other but with the carboxylic acid groups of other amino acids to form peptide bonds. And we'll come back to that in another slide. So the fourth group is this group R, okay, which is a side chain, okay, or the variable group. And this is the bit, bit that makes a particular amino acid, um, a particular amino acid, if you like. So there are 20 different amino acids, and they all differ from each other in that they have different R groups. Okay, so some of these R groups are... Um, ionic um, configurations of elements, some of them are um, hydrophobic, um, some of them are very simple, so the most simplest one is glycine, okay, and the, the amino acid glycine, just as a R group, which is just a, a hydrogen atom, okay, so amino group, okay, so that's the amino group, um, it's the poisonous bit, um, carboxylic acid group, which is that bit there, Okay, and the R group, which is the bit that is different from amino acid to amino acid. And remember, there are 20 different amino acids. Okay, um, and R groups vary in their um, chemical characteristics, and that influences the R groups, are the key thing which influences how these chains of amino acids fold up to form particular structures. It's the interaction between R groups which determines the folding. Okay, so the uh, we'll come back to that later. Anyway, so that uh, deals with the structure of an amino acid. Okay, moving on to the next slide. The next slide wants to know how amino acids, which we looked at on the last slide, join together to form um, dipeptides and polypeptides. Okay, and the bonds are called peptide bonds. Okay, this should be familiar to you. Okay, a dipeptide is simply two amino acids joined together. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at here. How two amino acids join to form a dipeptide. And they do that by our familiar chemical reaction called a condensation reaction. And remember, a condensation reaction produces a molecule of water. So we strip out two hydrogens and an oxygen, okay, and that means that this carbon bonds directly to that nitrogen there, okay, and we get this bond here, okay, and that characteristic uh, arrangement of atoms with the carbon double bonded to oxygen and a nitrogen, and that nitrogen bonded to a hydrogen, and the carbon of the other amino acid is what we call a peptide bond, okay, and that's formed by a condensation reaction, okay, and don't forget a molecule of water is formed. The opposite of that is a hydrolysis, okay, so we break this bond, we break it by adding water, okay, which we can do by boiling this up in an acid or using an enzyme, adds a molecule of water which breaks that bond to give us our two amino acids back, okay, so condensation producing water to form a peptide bond, hydrolysis is adding a molecule of water 
to break the bond. Okay, and I've got a little um, a little animation just to show that. Okay, so here I've got our uh, two amino acids, one one amino acid here, one amino acid there. Okay, and what's happening is that they're approaching each other, and we remove two hydrogens and an oxygen. Okay, so that's our water molecule in red band there being produced. Okay, and the peptide bond is formed. Okay, so that's how it forms. And then if I reverse that, okay, by going backwards, um, I add the molecule of water, which breaks that bond to give me my two amino acids back. Okay, so that's how peptide bonds are formed by the combination of the acid group, the carboxylic acid group of one amino acid and the amino group of another. Okay, removing a molecule of water to form a peptide bond. Reaction is known as a condensation reaction, and that's reversed by breaking the bond by a hydrolysis reaction. Moving on to the next slide. This slide looks at describing the, the aid of diagrams, the formation and breakage of peptide bonds in the synthesis and this slide looks at the first level of description that we have for protein structure. As we'll find as we go through the next, uh, next four slides, we can describe the structure of a protein at four different levels. Primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. So this slide deals with the most simple description of a protein, okay, which we describe as its primary structure. And the primary structure is very simply the sequence in which the amino acids occur. Okay, so the idea here is that there are 20 different types of amino acid, and they occur in a particular order, which is determined by the base sequence on DNA. And, but the, in terms of the, the protein, the order of amino acids determines the order of the R groups, the R variable groups, and the order of the R variable groups determines the way in which neighbouring R groups interact with each other and the way in which that polypeptide folds up. Okay, so for example, here we have got two amino acids of cysteine, okay, which are obviously encountered each other and form this covalent bond, which we call the disulfide bridge, which means that this folds up in this particular way. Okay, so the sequence of these determines the folding. Okay, so as I go quickly go through that, primary structure is a sequence keyword of amino acids in a polypeptide, and the amino acids, they're all linked by peptide bonds here, so these are the key things, the, the primary structure is held together by peptide bonds, and the sequence of R groups determines bonds between neighbouring amino acids, and the bonding between R groups determines the folding, okay, so the idea of this folds, okay, and it folds into secondary structures, which is what the next slide is all about, so moving to the next slide. So this slide, as we said before, secondary structures, we're interested in secondary structures here. Okay, so the primary structure, the sequence of amino acids, as we said, has a particular sequence of R groups, which determines folding. And there are certain characteristic ways that um, amino acids fold up to form secondary structures. And there are two particular secondary structures you need to know about. One is called an alpha helix, and one is called a beta pleated sheet. Okay. Not great diagrams, I've got a better one below. But anyway, sections or domains, the idea of domain, which is just a region of our polypeptide, okay, will fold up into um, particular uh, characteristic structures, and we call these secondary structures. Okay? And the two that you need to know about are alpha helix and beta pleated sheet keywords, and know a little bit about what they are. But the key thing about both alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets is that the, these structures are held together by hydrogen bonds. Okay, So the only bond we need to worry about when it comes to secondary structures is a hydrogen bond. Okay, So actually, I've got, as I said, I've got a slightly better diagram here of an alpha helix and a beta pleated sheet. So what we're saying here is here there's a helical structure. This is an alpha helix. And essentially what we've got, we've got a characteristic sequence of amino acids, which when they 
um, form a sequence, will always fold up into this particular shaped structure, which is called an alpha helix. And the whole thing is held in place by these dotted lines, which represent hydrogen bonds. Okay. Whereas a different sequence of amino acids will fold up in a completely different way to form this type of structure, which is known as a beta pleated sheet. Okay, so we have a, a strand of um, amino acids which forms a polypeptide, and then that turns back on itself to form, if you like, an anti parallel strand. Okay, and hydrogen bonds hold the two strands together. Okay, and that's known as a beta pleated sheet because this can obviously keep folding back on itself to form a sheet like structure. Okay, that's known as beta pleated sheet. Okay, so you've got to know secondary structures, alpha helix, beta pleated sheet, and they're held together with hydrogen bonds. The next level of description of the structure of a protein is tertiary structure. Okay, so we'll look at that on the next slide. This So this looks at tertiary structure, explained with the aid of the diagrams the term tertiary structure with reference to hydrophobic, hydrophilic, disulfide, ionic interactions. Okay, So the, the structures that we talked about in the last slide, the secondary structures such as the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet, those domains of structure, what they then do is they fold in on each other to form a characteristic three-dimensional shape. So if you like... The sequence of secondary structures, or domains of secondary structure, then fold in on each other, okay? And that will um, end up providing this specific three-dimensional structure. And it's these three-dimensional structures which are key to the function of that protein, okay? Now, the things you've got to know about these is that they, there are five bonds involved in holding this tertiary structure together, okay? Uh, hydrophobic interactions, hydrophilic interactions, disulfide bonds, and ionic interactions. Okay, um, so very quickly going through these, we've got ionic bonds. Okay, these are some variable groups. R groups are positive and negative, and obviously positives will attract negatives, which will alter the way in which um, the structure folds up. Disulfide bonds. These are actually covalent bonds, which occur between two. Um, particular amino acids called cysteines, which contain the element sulfur. Okay, so it's a bond between two sulf sulfur things, hence known as disulfide bonds. There's also hydrophobic interactions. Uh, some R groups are uh, nonpolar, um, so they're hydrophobic, a bit like the, uh, the tail of a phospholipid. And what they do is that they avoid. Um, they get repelled by water, so they avoid water. So what they tend to do when in solution, they tend to orientate themselves towards the middle of a molecule to get away from the water surrounding it. Conversely, hydrophilic action um, groups, okay, so polar R groups, will tend to interact with water and will tend to um, uh, will tend to orientate themselves so they're towards the outside of a protein in contact with the surrounding water. And then there are hydrogen bonds which we've come across. Um, with the water and everything else, okay, and they um, are important at holding these structures together. Okay, so diagrammatically looking at all of that, uh, here I have a protein, okay, and as you'll notice, it's a sequence, um, so we've got one end working all the way through to the other end of the protein, which I can't actually see at the moment, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, so we've got, this is the start of the protein, and it uh, works its way around. Okay, but as we can see, domains of structure fold up in particular secondary ways. So here's an alpha helical structure, okay, and then what's happened is it's moved through, and then the next domain folds up as a beta pleated sheet, okay, and then we get another bit of alpha helix here, okay, and then this moves into more beta pleated sheets, etc. Okay, so different domains of secondary structure then fold in on each other to form this overall three-dimensional shape. Okay, which is the description of the the tertiary structure of the protein. Okay, um, in terms of I've got another little animation here, which we can also quickly have a look at, which illustrates all of that as well. Superimposed on primary and secondary structure is tertiary structure. Irregular loops and folds that give the protein its overall three-dimensional shape. 
The irregular folding of tertiary structure results from interactions among the R groups of amino acids. Acidic and basic R groups ionize, and these positively and negatively charged groups may form ionic bonds. So the, these are the ionic bonds that I talked about. Okay, so between positively charged, sorry, positively charged R groups and negatively charged R groups, they will attract each other, which will alter the way that these two domains of the protein um, orientate themselves. Okay, so let's say that was a positive charge and that was a positive charge. They'd be repelling each other, which would alter the shape of this protein. But they don't because they're, they're, in this particular case it's positive to negative and therefore they attract each other which alters the way that this part of the protein is shaped. Polar forces also contribute to tertiary structure. Hydrophilic or polar R groups may hydrogen bind with one another or turn outward and hydrogen bind with the surrounding water. Hydrophobic, non-polar R groups cluster on the inside of the protein away from water. Tertiary structure may be further stabilized. Okay, so the, what he's talking about there, that polar force we talked about here, here that, that's actually what we call a hydrophilic interaction. Okay, so that's either hydrophilic R groups being attracted to each other or hydrophilic groups being attracted to water right, on the outside. So these tend to orientate themselves towards the outside of a protein where there's a watery environment. Okay, whereas these structures here are hydrophobic regions and what they tend to do is cluster together to get away from the water and again that alters the way in which this protein folds up. It's further stabilized by strong covalent bonds between sulfur atoms in certain R groups. So lastly there we have this idea of what we call a disulfide bridge Okay, there are, there's a particular amino acid called cysteine, and they have um, groups that stick out of them which are um, sulfhydryl groups, okay, and uh, they can react with each other to form a disulfide bridge, which you should know about the, uh, the disulfide bridges, okay. Um, breaking, breaking and uh, reforming disulfide bridges is how hairdressers give people perms, okay, they, they, they reduce the disulfide bridges, okay, uh, then they set your hair in the shape you want it to be, and then they oxidize them again uh, to form the disulfide bridges in different places, okay, so that's a, a little aside you don't have to know about, uh, but anyway, next time you go for a perm in the hairdresser, you'll know it's all to do with disulfide bridges. Moving on to the next slide. So the next slide deals with tertiary structure. So we looked at primary structure, the sequence of amino acids. We've looked at the secondary structure, how those sequences of amino acids fold up to form repeating structures such as alpha and beta, alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. And we've looked at how those secondary structures then fold in on each other um, and bind to each other through a raft of different um, chemical bonds and interactions to form a three-dimensional structure which we call tertiary structure. Now some proteins uh, are consist of more than one polypeptide chain. Okay? And if they do so, the way in which those polypeptide chains attach themselves to each other is described as being its quaternary structure. Okay? So as we say here, the quaternary structure, okay? some proteins consist of more than one polypeptide, and basically it's a description of how these polypeptides polypeptides are arranged. Okay? And the example we all have is haemoglobin. And I'll just enlarge this picture so we can have a quick look at haemoglobin, which we'll do on the next slide as well. Uh, but if I just enlarge the structure for a minute, okay, this is a haemoglobin molecule. And as you'll notice, it's got actually made of four different polypeptides. Okay? We call them beta chains and alpha chains. Be careful not to confuse this nomenclature with alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. The alpha and beta here has got nothing to do with helixes and beta pleated sheets. It's just using this alpha and beta nomenclature um, for, for something else. Okay, A bit like alpha and beta glucose, we often use alpha and beta, but this has got nothing to do with alpha helixes. Okay, So we've got two different types of chain, Okay, uh, and uh, two, if you like, two different types of polypeptide, two of each, Okay, and that makes up a 
a hemoglobin molecule. Okay, so we say that the hemoglobin has a quaternary structure because the way in which these chains attach themselves to each other okay, forms its quaternary structure. And as we'll see, just to make it more complicated, hemoglobin, um, as a lot of these um, quaternary um, structures have, non-protein bits attached to them as well. Okay, and we call those non-protein groups prosthetic groups. And we'll come back to look at those in a minute. Okay, so going back to the, uh, the structure here, so haemoglobin, which you've got to know a bit about, consists of four polypeptide chains, as we've just looked at, uh, each of which has a non-protein component, which in the case of haemoglobin we call a heme group, okay? And the heme group is an example of something that we call a prosthetic group, and I think we come back to that in the next slide, so don't worry too much about it. Haemoglobin is also highly folded, okay, so each polypeptide chain, the tertiary structure here, is highly folded, which makes it very compact, water-soluble, and compact, water-soluble proteins we describe as being globular, globular proteins, okay, and we'll, again, we'll come back to talk about that um, in a minute as well, okay. So, the, bo the bonds that hold these four polypeptide chains together in this overall structure, which we call its quaternary structure, are exactly the same raft of bonds that we talked about for tertiary structure, i.e. hydrogen bonds, ionic interactions, hydrophobic interactions, hydrophilic interactions, and then these covalent bonds between cysteine amino acids, which we call disulfide bonds. Okay, so little diagram here, silly little diagram, but illustrates it quite nicely. So this if this, imagine this was a protein, okay, this protein is made of three different polypeptide chains. So each of these polypeptide chains has its own primary sequence or primary structure, its own secondary structures and its own tertiary structure to form its characteristic three-dimensional shape. Okay, so that one would have the same and this also has its characteristic primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structures, but they then interact with each other, so this red polypeptide interacts with the, the pink one and the blue one, and there are bonds between all of these, okay, which hold this structure into this particular shape, which determines its function, and the bonds that hold these on, on place are the bonds we've just described, okay, these bonds up here, hydrogen, ionic interactions, hydrophobic interactions, hydrophilic interactions, and disulfide bonds, okay, so so moving on to the next slide. The next slide requires you to describe with the aid of diagram the structure of a collagen molecule. Okay, so in the last slide we looked at a quaternary protein, hemoglobin, okay, with its four highly compact um, polypeptides which form this really compact structure which is water soluble and we call that a globular protein. The the opposite of a globular protein is a type of pro protein that we call a fibrous protein. And these tend to be proteins which are involved in structure. They're structural proteins rather than proteins that are involved in carrying oxygen or enzymes and so on. Okay, so the, uh, the one we're going to look at here is collagen. And collagen is uh, hugely important in, in all sorts of things. It's important in the, in the walls of arteries and veins. It's important in ligaments and tendons. Okay, it's important in basement membranes that we'll come across uh, in the A2 course as well. Okay, so collagen is a fibrous protein. And what it, how it's worked, it's made of three... One, two, three strands of polypeptide, okay, which um, just form big long structures, not very much in the way of tertiary folding, okay, so they just uh, lots of secondary folding, so the helical structures. And what happens is that they wind round each other, a bit like a sort of plaiting of hair, as it were, to form this structure, which is, well, it's like a rope, really, if you can imagine a rope having uh, strands which are twisted round each other to form a rope structure, okay, so that's the collagen. Uh, fiber. So it's three helical polypeptides wound around each other like a rope. And there's lots and lots of hydrogen bonds which stick the strands together. Okay, So each hydrogen bond is not hugely strong, but because there are so many of these hydrogen bonds together, they, they hold the structure together very firmly. Um, and there are also the odd covalent bond which, which binds these 
um, structures together. The other thing you should know about, because uh, I've, I've seen it in a, an AS question, is they ask you what's the predominant amino acid in collagen, and the answer is glycine, which is that very simple amino acid where the R group is just hydrogen. Okay, so uh, I've got another diagram down here, which shows it a little bit better. Okay, so here is, if you like, our collagen molecule, so it's got three of these, so here's a, if you like, a, um, a polypeptide chain, Okay, which forms this helical structure, and then there are three of these, okay, and they will wind around each other to form this um, sort of rope like structure. Okay, and how that fits, obviously, we're talking about something which is at molecular level, okay, so we could never see this, okay, even with an electron microscope, we could never see one of these fibers, just one of these uh, um, three uh, strands of polypeptide. We're talking at molecular level, okay, but um, what they do is that they are arranged, okay, into, um, so here's our trihelical structure, okay, these are arranged into units, okay, which are called fibrils, okay, so a fibrils is just a collection of these um, collagen molecules, okay, and these fibrils then form part of a larger structure which we call a collagen fibre. Okay, and this collagen fibre would be large enough for us to be able to see through an electron microscope. Okay, so molecular fibril fibre, okay, um, is the way that these collagen fibres, which are very important structural molecules um, for bone, um, tendon, um, basement membranes, etc. Okay, moving on to the last slide. Nothing particularly new on this slide. Uh, it just wants us to um, emphasize the difference between a globular protein and a fibrous protein. So the globular protein, which we already looked at, you also know it's about hemoglobin, whereas the fibrous um, I've actually written fibrin there, which is rubbish. I was supposed to say collagen there. Okay, so what we look at is globular proteins. They are characterized by being soluble in water, or sometimes they're soluble in lipid bilayers. Okay, um, some of the ones that we find in membranes, like carrier proteins, are soluble in lipid bilayers. Uh, but a lot of them, like enzymes and hemoglobin, are soluble in water. Whereas fibrous ones are insoluble in water. Okay. Globular proteins have got compact structures, okay, where fibrous are long, fibrous um, extended structures, okay. Globular proteins tend to have a primary structure which has a, a, wide, a wide range of different amino acids in it, whereas the primary structure in, in uh, a fibrous protein tends to have a smaller variety, okay. The example, 35% of uh, amino acids in the collagen uh, collagen molecules is the amino acid glycine. Okay. Next one is the tertiary structure involves lots and lots of folding. Okay, so the secondary structures, sorry, I'll go back one, I missed one. Secondary structure is complex with lots of different alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. Okay, whereas the secondary structures for fibrous tends to be rather simple and based on only one type of um, type of folding. So our uh, collagen there is just a, a helical structure, okay, and it doesn't vary. No beta pleated sheets or other secondary structures. Just one particular type of um, of structure. Okay, silk is another fibrous protein which is predominantly made of beta pleated sheets. Okay, and for tertiary structures, for globular, there tends to be lots of folding. So the uh, the, ter the secondary structures fold in on each other to form this really compact shape. Okay, whereas in fibrous, the tertiary structures does not involve much folding at all, if any. Um, so that's uh, the tertiary structure folding is far less complex in fibrous proteins. Quaternary structures in globular proteins uh, tend to be head held together by non-covalent bonds, so hydrophobic interactions, hydrophilic interactions, and so on. Whereas in fibrous proteins, because they're structural and have to be very strong, we often find covalent bonds. Um, such as disulfide bridges, are involved in holding those structures together. Okay, Globular proteins often contain one of these prosthetic groups which we talked about. A prosthetic group is a non-protein group which is part of our protein. Okay, And the example for the haemoglobin, our prosthetic group, is called a heme. 
molecule, and the heme molecule contains the iron ion, okay, which is involved in binding to oxygen. Okay, so we describe that as being a prosthetic group, okay, which is a non-protein bit stuck into the middle of our molecule. Whereas in fibrous proteins, we don't encounter prosthetic groups. Okay, so there's no prosthetic groups in collagen. Okay, what they actually do, these um, globular proteins tend to be involved in some sort of metabolism, some sort of chemical reaction that's going on. So oxygen carriage and hemoglobin, enzymes are all globular, hormones that are dissolved in blood and transported in blood and bind to hormone receptors tend to be globular. The carrier proteins that you encounter in F211, which are globular proteins within phospholipid bilayers, are also globular. Whereas fibrous proteins tend to be structural, okay, so tendons, bone, skin, hair, ligaments would all be made of fibrous proteins, okay. Now, just uh, looking at those two structures, our collagen, okay, and our hemoglobin, that they want you to be able to compare. I've got a diagram of those two side by side down here. Um, so here is our collagen molecule with our three strands, our three um, polypeptides, okay, and those polypeptides wrap around each other to form... Um, this rope-like um, arrangement, okay, and this is very held together by many, many hydrogen bonds plus the odd, the odd covalent bond which holds these three structures together, okay, and these this structure then groups together with other similar structures to form what we call um, fibrils, okay, and then those fibrils then um, then join together with other fibrils to form fibers and fibers are actually big enough for us to see with an electron microscope okay so they're structural proteins whereas here is our hemoglobin molecule okay which is with its four different four different um, polypeptides okay there's two different types uh, alpha chains okay those are two alpha chains here and two beta chains okay and each each polypeptide has its own prosthetic group which is called a heme group which binds to the oxygen and contains the iron ion there. Um, and anyway, there's lots and lots of folding here, okay, uh, that's compact shape, water soluble, uh, and that characterizes what we would call a globular protein as opposed to this one here, which we call a fibrous protein. Okay, so that concludes our quick revision screencast on proteins.